Praise the Lord. Um, this is just kind of a confirmation, though the Word doesn't really need confirmation other than the Spirit of Christ that's within us that bears witness to it. But uh, I know for about a week I've really been just groaning in my spirit and, and, and you know, you get to that place and you just, uh, there's nothing you can do but just cry out. I thought of the scripture, I want to read this scripture first and I'm going to jump over to Romans. But uh, in Galatians chapter 4, uh, Paul's talking here and he says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he's a child, differs nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. I mean, he's talking about the heir, he's talking about Christ here. But is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so, when we were children, we're in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Do you know what that's saying there? You know, in Ephesians, I think it's chapter 4, it says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. When this was done, when we received that adoption from God, it was sealed. There's a contract you have with God that cannot be broken. It's not really a contract, it's a covenant. Contracts can be broken, but this one can't. It is sealed by God. And it's for you and me for eternity. And nothing can take that away. Amen. Nothing. But then the next verse here um, is what the verse that came to me, and he says, Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. I know that, uh, you know, like I was saying, you know, when you get, when you get to the place where you're groaning uh, within, um, you're just down to, you don't even know what to pray for. And uh, turn over to Romans chapter 8 for just a second, because I wanted to read this too. Um, Paul, Bear, Paul basically says the same thing here. Um, he says, but you are not in the flesh, verse 9, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. You know what Phil was saying there about being born again, this is where it's got to start. You've got to receive that spirit of the son into your heart. And that happens when you're born again. And once that spirit comes in, and it's through the word, it's through that incorruptible seed of God, when it comes into your heart, that's, that cannot die. That is full of life and power, and it will accomplish the purpose that God sent it forth to do. In you, in me, and every one of us, whatever the problems are that exist in us, that spirit is going to continue to grow. That, that word is going to continue to grow. It's going to continue to come forth. It's going to continue to be in us to cause us to cry out to God. And um, he said, if the Spirit of God dwell in you, now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. But he goes on down to verse 15, and he says, for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. See, that's what Phil was saying too. God's fear has no place in God. Where, where is fear? Where is fear in God? God is love. In love there is no fear. Love casts out all fear. There is no fear. And we don't have to be afraid or timid or, or anything else to come before our Father and to ask Him for help. But He said, but you have received the spirit of adoption. There it is again. That adoption that Paul was talking about over there in Galatians. We are sons. We have been made sons and joint heirs with Christ. The same thing that Christ has access to, we have access to today. And all we have to do is go to him and ask for it. And he's right there to give it to us. Now, it may not come like that overnight, because that's what Jesus is teaching, that we, we need to be patient and we need to wait, because God has a, a time for things to happen. There's a time for me to be delivered from this or from that. God wants to teach me something. He wants to teach me his word, his ways. He wants me to learn about him and how he operates. And that takes patience. We, if, we, if we had our, our way, we'd be just, you know. But the thing of it is, once that's done, we got no other purpose down here. God's going to take us home. <laughs> so anyway, 
But he said, he said, but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. There it is again, that same spirit coming forth, crying out to God because we need him, just like Jesus did. And the spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And because you have that in you, it ought to bear witness with you. That there's something there that wants to please God. There's something there that, that's reaching out that really wants God to, to work and, and to do whatever he needs to do in our vessels. That ought to encourage every one of us. That's the spirit bearing witness with our spirit. And if children and heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. <laughs> we, ought, we ought to be rejoicing, beloved. We ought, to be, we ought to be thanking God. Then he comes on down. Verse 22, he says, For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. We're groaning within because we haven't got there yet. There's something going on in us. There's a work of the Spirit being done in our hearts. And he says, and not only they, but ourselves only. And he's talking about the world up there, but he, he's saying now, not only the world, but us, Christians, those that have been born again. Also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. Because <laughs> our bodies are still here in this world. The Spirit is within these bodies. And there, there, therein lies the battle, the struggle, and the continual uh, reason for having to go to God in prayer and ask for his help. Because we can't do these things in ourselves. So it says, verse 24, for we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man sees, why do you hope for it? If you've got it in your hand, you don't have to go and, pray and ask for it. It's right there. But he says, but if we hope for that which we see not, then we do with what? Patience. Wait for it. It's coming. It's coming. God promised. It's coming. And he says, likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities. Now listen to what he says here. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. I'm, I'm sorry, beloved, but we don't know what to pray for. We don't. Not in ourselves. But let me tell you, the Spirit of God that's in there growing, crying, Abba, Father, he knows what to pray for. He knows what to say. He says, but the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. You get to the place sometimes where you just groan. You don't know what to pray. You don't know what to ask God. You know that there's need, but you don't know what it is. Let me tell you, the Spirit knows. All we have to do is put our, ourselves in a position where that spirit can pray through us. But if we don't ever put ourselves in a position, if we don't go out and, and just stand before God or, or walk with God, or you know, and sometimes you need to go out and you may just feel like the heavens are brass that every word is falling off your lips. Let me tell you, speak to yourselves in psalms, songs, spiritual songs, sing, make melody in your heart to the Lord. Because let me tell you something, in praise, the Spirit of God dwells. It inhabits that praise. And when that Spirit comes, then maybe you can get free to pray. Then God will be able to direct you and lead you in prayer. And you'll be able to know what to pray for. But he says, he searches the heart. He that searches the heart knows what is the mind of the Spirit. Because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. That's our God working in us. I appreciate this. This is the answer of prayer. This is the answer of those groanings that, that I've been going through and experiencing. I mean, God, God is faithful. We need to see that. And when we pray and we come into these services, it's, it's not just, I hate to say service, come into services. It sounds like some kind of something, a tradition or a form that we just do every week. It's God gathering his people together. And when we gather together like this, everybody should, be, should have been crying out to God to, for something. Lord, feed us. Show us what we need. Lord, help us. All this, all the word that God gives us is meant for one purpose, to draw us together, closer together, a, a, a knit family, knit together in love and in him. And, and that way God can, God can just move through the whole body. 
you know, it's not just one or two. Now, I know he calls certain ones to do certain things, but by the same token, we're a body of Christ. You're my brother. You're my sister. I need what God has shown you. And you might need what God shows me, though I'm, I'm not so sure about that. But, but I want to I go on just a little bit farther beyond this because I don't think it's an accident that Paul says the next few verses in this scripture. He's talking about prayer. He's talking about groaning, travailing. Now he's encouraging us. He's saying, for we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. He's encouraging us here. If you're in this position where you're groaning and crying out, there must be something happening that has you questioning. Is this God? What, what's happening, God? I mean, why, why has this come upon me? You know, uh, is that you? I mean, are you, are you doing something? No, he's, now Paul is saying that all things work together for good to those that love God, to them that who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. <laughs> Look what he's saying here. You know, what you're going through, don't, don't let that hinder you. Don't let that stop you. Because he foreknew you. And he's already ordained that you're going to be conformed to the image of his son. That he might be the firstborn above many brethren. Jesus is up there waiting for the rest of us. He's waiting for the rest of his brethren. Well, he's not up there. He's down here with us this morning by the Spirit. But he, they're waiting for us up there. And it's going to happen sooner or later. And he, like the brother said last night, there's, a, there's an end. <laughs> there's an end to everything. So it says, moreover, he did predestinate us. He predest whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. You're glorified this morning. And he said, what shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? When the devil stands in your face and tries to drive you down into the ground, condemning you, beating you up over whatever, let me tell you something, you can rise up against him. That's what the scripture over in uh, Isaiah 54 says. No weapon that's formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that rises against you in judgment thou shalt condemn. For this is the heritage of the children of God, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Our righteousness, our stand, our, our ability, our uh, right to come before God is because of what he has done for us. It has no basis of what I've done or how I've messed up or anything else. My ability to come before God is because he said I could do it. Because he's my father. And no one can take that away. And that's what he's saying here. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifies. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. He is praying for us. And he, you know how he does that? He prays for us through each other. That's how he does it. That's why we need to make ourselves available to God. And we need to come before God every day. We need, we need to seek his face every day. Get along with him. Linda and I pray in the morning. When I go out and I'm working in the garden or something, I'll be talking with the Lord about stuff. We need to do that. We need to try to get closer to him. That's, what he, that's the whole purpose of our being here. Is to be, be so close to him that he can use us. It's not all, always a matter of, of speaking or saying a word to everybody we bump into. But we can have, a, a, have salt to lay out there. We can have something that, that'll entice people. That'll give them, uh, give them something, you know, to be drawn. That's how God draws people. And, uh, but let's pray about that. But who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. I think he pretty much covered everything there in those last few verses. I just thank God. God, I just thank you.
for this word. I thank you for, Lord, sending it, Lord. I thank you for the, the vessel that you were able to use. I thank him every day for, for answering my prayers. He's just, he's worthy of praise. I appreciate this truth this morning. I was thinking about that scripture there, Ron read, if God be for us, who can be against us? You know, that's a, that's a pretty strong statement right there. If he's with us, nothing can be against us. That's the, that's the clear thought of that scripture there. So is it any wonder then that the enemy attacks that idea so hard as to whether God's for us or not? I mean, that's really a foundational idea to understand for us to live for him. You know, if we've been talking and we've heard so much that what, in fact, Phil said it this morning, what he really seeks is relationship. It's not doctrine. It's not all these specific issues as much as it is relationship. And as we walk together, he can show us the specific things we need to know. Well, that's why the enemy spends so much time attacking relationship. Not attacking the specific you know, doctrinal points. and He spends time attacking relationship because that's the very thing, that's the very heart of what God's trying to, to form with us. And I just appreciate the Lord shining light this morning because that's what the light does. is expo It exposes where the enemy tries to work because he works in darkness and he works when we're alone and we're, we're in our own minds thinking these things. And that's where he works. And when the light of God's word shines on his lies, it exposes them as the lies that they are. And we can lay hold of the truth. And I believe God's minister in faith this morning to lay hold of his truth in the, in the face of what the enemy's trying to do and his lies. And I just thought real quickly, I know it's getting late, but I wanted to read this. It's, I, I know I've read this before, but it's just such a blessing to think about. Let's turn to Esther chapter 4. As I just see such a beautiful picture in this of, of exactly what the Lord is, is doing for us today and inviting us today. Of course, the backstory here, most of you know about what the book of Esther is about. It was on the, this particular point, Esther was the queen of, of Persia. And um, there was a guy who was in the government there, highly placed in the government, her uncle named Mordecai, and he was a, an official in the government. He had found out about this plot that somebody else in the government who didn't like Mordecai had concocted basically to exterminate all the Jews in the kingdom. At a certain time, he had arranged it where they had sent, sent out word, and on this certain day, they basically had permission to wipe out all the Jews. It's what it boiled down to. Well, he found out about it, and so he wanted to send word to, to Esther about that. He was mourning and praying and seeking God, and Esther heard about it. She sent somebody to find out what's going on what's bothering Mordecai. So he explained to her, and in verse, uh, verse 8 of chapter 4, it says, Mordecai, talking about Mordecai, it says, he also gave him, that's the messenger, a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show Esther and explain it to her. And he told him to urge her to go into the king's presence and beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. So here's the situation. Here's a need. And this man is telling Esther, look, here's this need. Go plead to the king that can do something about this need. Take this need to him. Well, when Esther got it, let's see what her response was. In verse 11, it, or he, she, in verse 10, it says, She instructed him to say to Mordecai to take this message back. All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that he be put to death. The only exception for this is for the king to extend the gold scepter to him and spare his life. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. You see what she's saying? She's saying, I can't just barge in his presence. He's the king. I can't just waltz in there with my request. He's got to summon me. You know, who am I to just walk in there in the king's presence? And if you do that, the only hope that you have is if he shows you mercy by extending the scepter and saying, okay, I'll receive you even though I didn't call you. And if that doesn't happen, it's death. She was afraid to take this need to the king. So she reported back to Mordecai, and he basically told her, this is what you're put in this position for. <laughs> you know, you have the responsibility to go to the king on our behalf. This is what you're here for. So then in verse 15, Esther said, she sent this reply to Mordecai. Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. She didn't sound real confident, did she? <laughs> Even at this point, she didn't have a ton of confidence that I have the right to go in there and bring this need to the king. In fact, she was worried about it to the point she said, I don't even have the faith to do it. I need people to pray for me that I'll actually be able to do this. We have the right to pray for one another, that we can go to our king, to our father with our needs. We have that privilege to be a part of that. She even asked him to fast for her. And they did it because there was a genuine need. And she said, I can't do this on my own. I need help. And the people prayed. Sometimes we need help just to pray, don't we? Didn't the Lord need that when he was in the garden travailing? That said, after he prayed an hour, angels came and ministered to him. But it didn't, that wasn't just like, okay, now I've got the strength I need and he left. They came and ministered to him so he could keep praying. 
Uh, that was travail. He needed, he needed help. He needed help to even be able to pray. And sometimes so do we. And praise God, we can pray for one another. But then let's look at what happened here um, on the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner courts of the palace in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall, facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther, now here's the moment of truth. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her and held out to her the gold scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of his scepter. And then the king said, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be given to you. You know, I know this was a heathen king and this was an earthly situation, but there's a picture here of our king, of our father, and us, that we have the right to come into his presence. And when he sees us, he will not reject us because, I don't know, because we didn't measure up or whatever our concept is. He extends that scepter to us. You know what that is? That's, that's covered with the blood of his son. He says, on that basis, I accept you. I'm pleased with you. Not just I put up with you and I'll accept you. I'm pleased to see you. I'm so glad to see you. Here's Esther. Nervous as all get out and asking people to fast and pray because she's so scared to go into his presence. And when she finally makes it into his presence, he says, I'm so glad to see you. What can I do for you? That's the invitation we have from our Father, a standing invitation to come into his presence and have him extend the blood of his son to us and say, I'm so pleased to see you. What is your request? Isn't that what he asked the blind man? What would you have me do for you? That's what he asked him. And that is our unbelievable privilege to come into his presence and be accepted and for him to say even if it's half the kingdom I'll give you whatever is on your heart that's that's what we can do I just am so thankful for that I appreciate it and God delivered his people on this occasion he used that and he delivered his people we have the right to go into his presence and bring these things to him for deliverance for us for deliverance for one another but praise God brothers we are accepted in the beloved and that is the foundation of everything what good does it do us to know every promise in this word if Satan can convince us that promise isn't for us personally? What, what difference does it make if we know every one of them? Just like Phil said, if all the doctrine is right, if he can convince you it's not for you individually, what good does it do you? But I tell you what, if we know the basis on which we're accepted, <laughs> it's what Jesus has already done. There's no other need. I just thank him and praise him.